Well, welcome everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure today to introduce to you uh, one of the most distinguished historians of Britain who has arrived recently from Britain and regrettably, I think, brought some weather with him. Please accept my apologies for the weather. I'm very, very sorry. Professor Sir David Canadine, however, has brought much more with him. He has brought uh, decades of uh, books and uh, essay writing and service to the historical profession. And in our conversation today, I hope we will get to hear uh, some of the insights that he has uh, accumulated over this time. He's the author of 12 books, the editor of at least 13 more. Uh, in addition to his numerous books, which include most famously perhaps The Decline and Fall of the British Aristocracy, a magisterial treatment of the later 19th and early 20th century period of transition in British society. His books include also uh, the first authorized biography, the only biography, and a monumental biography of Andrew Mellon, uh, a banker and a patron of the arts, and uh, as well, most recently, a book entitled Making History Now and Then, uh, which explores the history of uh, the teaching of history in Britain. Uh, professor Canadine, uh, who currently teaches at Princeton University as the Dodge Professor of History, has uh, taught previously at Cambridge as well as served as the director of the Institute of Historical Research at the University of London. And I mentioned this position in particular because aside from his work as an author and as a teacher, Professor Canadine has also been an active member of the public historical profession. He serves as the chair of the National Portrait Gallery in Britain and is on innumerable uh, commissions dedicated to things like the opening of archives uh, in Britain uh, and much more. Uh, by the way, is there music coming from somewhere? Is that disturbing people? I don't know if that can be uh, adjusted at all. Okay, good. Uh, it's sort of echoing up here on the stage a little, unfortunately. Anyway, with this uh, distinguished uh, collection of, of uh, topics on which uh, David is expert, uh, we're going to zoom in today on one in particular, a work that was published in 2001, a book entitled Ornamentalism, How the British Saw Their Empire. And so I thought I would begin the conversation with David today by asking you a bit about the title of that work and how you came to arrive at it and what it represents. Well, thank you, Maya, and thank you all for coming on this dreadful day. It's very good of you to come, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, the specifics of how this title came about uh, is the following, that there is in London, um, just north of Oxford Street, a very grand house which used to be owned by the Earls of Derby. It was their townhouse. The Earls of Derby were fabulously rich uh, aristocrats owning most of Lancashire and all of the coal underneath it, and they had a lot of money. They had a very grand house uh, just north of Oxford Street. Um, and they sold it um, after the Second World War, and it became a club. Um, and it became the Oriental Club, which indeed it still is. Um, and on one evening, a friend of mine was saying, oh, there's this place called the Oriental Club along uh, Oxford Street. Um, someone told me, he said to me, that um, they got into a taxi and wanted to give directions to go to that club, but they said instead, take me to the Ornamental Club. Um, and I suddenly thought, oh, that's the title for this book. Because, of course, the, the play on words in this title is, I shouldn't have put it in, but anyway, there it is. Um, and the subtitle isn't very accurate, so on the whole, the, the titles are kind of catastrophe, really, in one way and another. Um, because, of course, the subtitle is how the British saw their empire. Well, all the British, you know, which Britons, when? Um, the Britons who went to clubs, as it were, the ruling elites, ordinary Britons who were not the ruling elites, what do I mean by the British? And various reviewers pointed that out, and they were, of course, uh, right to do so. But what I wanted to explore was how far it's possible to understand what sense of their empire, at least the ruling 
classes of Britain had and how far in understanding what they thought the empire looked like they were projecting onto the empire their sense of how Britain itself looked and how far thinking about the empire, uh, imagining what the empire looked like was in a sense a gross oversimplification because it presumed they had an idea of what Britain looked like and that they then projected it onto the empire even if their notion of what Britain looked like was probably pretty oversimplified and their claim that you could project that onto the empire was probably no more than partially valid. And I wanted, in a sense, to play around with that set of uh, themes. I mean, if you said to David Cameron today, well, you're Prime Minister of Britain, what does British society look like? I have no idea what he would answer. And one might say, well, you're in charge of this country, you're supposed to be governing it, surely you have some idea what Britain looks like. And on the whole, I think, notions in the 19th and 20th century of what Britain looked like were themselves fairly simplified, and not, I think, as class-based as is often argued by historians. And I think, to some degree, this notion of Britain as a rural hierarchy, an agrarian society, was projected by members of the British ruling and proconsular class onto the empire that f certain bits of it they settled, other bits of it, classically South Asia, they ruled. So when you say, how, what did the empire look like? for the British, what you really are getting at here is what the social structures of the empire looked like to yes, the British. I was trying to think about the issue of the British Empire as a sociological construction, or at least as an imagined sociological construction. And in doing that, what I wanted to try to open up was a set of issues about empire <coughs> and about Britain, which it seemed to me the kind of um, the history of Britain and its empire done as the history of government policy didn't do, um, and the history of Britain and its empire as cultural history, Edward Said, didn't really do. Um, and since empire is a complicated thing, it seems to me there are lots of different ways in which one might approach it. And I wanted to try to make the case in this book that one of the ways that the British empire needed to be approached was as a kind of sociological construction. Um, how far it did or didn't relate to the sociology of Britain, and how far people governing it were motivated by a set of views of imperial sociology and where those views came from. And that still seems to me to be a line of inquiry that I think the book did try to open up and that is perhaps still worth pursuing. Yes, I agree. I think one of the great contributions of this book is to call our attention to the, the sheer number of people, in a sense, who are responsible for creating a system of empire that is so wide-ranging. But you also talk in the book uh, in, in very uh, uh, illuminating ways and also often rather entertaining, despite, uh, despite the, the themselves, that is, those who created it, about the systems through which the British actually did superimpose a kind of understanding of society onto the empire. Could you tell us a little bit about some of those mechanisms? Yes. Um, one of the things that has always intrigued me about the history of the British Empire is actually how it worked. Uh, that's to say, the governing structures that were created for it, or as it were, assimilated to it. And this is particularly so because I mean, it, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when I was growing up that large parts of the world were still coloured red, and in the old days that was the British Empire. And before I was born, even more parts of the world were coloured red. And it gave the impression, those atlases, of an extraordinarily powerful and coherent and monolithic organisation. Um, well, one of the things that's emerged, I suppose, over the last 50 years or so, as more work's been done on how the British Empire worked, is that that, in, that picture, that cartographical vision of um, homogeneity, uniformity, and in some senses power, was in many ways misleading. Because in fact the British ran their empire on a shoestring. They never spent much money on it. Um, they didn't have many people to administer it. Um, and with the exception of the Indian army, they didn't have a large military force to subjugate it, or indeed to defend it from external attack. Um, and that's a very different notion of empire from the picture conveyed in atlases where it's all red and it all seems coherent, strong, and, as it were, purposeful. 
Well, if that's the case, that in some senses the British Empire, from a British perspective, was a shoestring enterprise, not much money spent on it, not many resources devoted to it, then it begs the question, well, how was it run? Um, and the answer to that, in part, is this concept uh, for many parts of the empire, which Lord Ludwig called indirect rule, which was that you took the structures of power that were already there um, and modelled on English counties, and this is the model for much of the British Empire, you <coughs> put authority in the hands of those people who were at the top of the social hierarchy, in exactly the way that, as it were, Trollope's Barset was run. And large parts of the empire, large parts of South Asia, uh, large parts of Africa, uh, were run in that way, because in fact the British didn't have sufficient resources to run it any other way. Um, and I was, part of what ornamentalism does is to draw attention to that. Um, and so when then it came uh, in the 1920s to creating new nations in the Middle East, off the back of the uh, deconstructed Ottoman Empire, the British followed exactly the same policy and they invented the Hashemite kingdoms of Iraq and of Jordan, uh, one of which, of course, is still with us to this day, the other not. Um, and so that's another reason, I think, why the sociology of empire is an important subject, because it actually is a way into understanding how the British not only saw their empire, but how they tried to govern large parts of it. And they really had no alternative but to do it that way, because the resources they committed to governing the empire were, in fact, so limited. So you have some lovely examples of the book of how the British sought to identify who the elite were in the first place, because often you show up somewhere and the first person who greets you on the beach is the person that you're dealing with, but you don't necessarily know what position they have in their society. And once the British have identified the people that they think are important, they go to great lengths to try to cultivate ties of loyalty between that elite and a British system at home. Could you tell us a little about some of those? Yes, that's absolutely right. And like I feel almost everything in this book, that idea isn't an original one. I just took a set of ideas that were around and put them all together and came up with this. And one of the ideas that underlies this book um, had been well explored by a British historian of empire, Ronald Robinson, who coined this phrase, collaborating elites. And he said that in order to understand the way the British governed large parts of their empire, what they needed were collaborators, because they couldn't do it by themselves, um, and the collaborators they sought to find were at the top of the social hierarchy, for reasons I've already given. One of the problems with that way of doing things is that the British often didn't know very much about the sociology of these parts of the world that they now found themselves in charge of. And so they weren't always very good at working out who the collaborating elites ought to be. Um, in this country, in India, um, they had the idea that the collaborating elites should be the rulers of the princely states. But they also, of course, had the notion there was something called the caste system. And they never quite understood the extraordinarily complicated sociology of South Asia. Um, they thought the caste system was just an analogy to the class structure of Britain, and they thought the rulers of the Indian princely states came at the top of the caste system, which of course wasn't really true. Um, but nevertheless, they settled in the end on the rulers of the princely states as being their major collaborators here in India. And that then became the model for indirect rule in Africa, and as I've already said, uh, for the creation of the Hashemite kingdoms in the Middle East. So if the British, as it were, uh, in the case of uh, Iraq and Jordan, if there wasn't already in place a kind of imperial sociology of the sort they wanted, they tried to create one. And of course the case of Mesopotamia is very poignant in this regard because they had to go searching around the Hejaz in order to identify rulers whom they then dumped on the thrones of these newly created states, leaving one of the many legacies of empire that we still can see in the world today. Indeed so, and of course the attempt to impose the Hashemite monarchies on uh, Mesopotamia, um, that's to say latter-day Iraq and Jordan, seems to have worked in the case of Jordan, but it did not at all work in the case of Iraq. And interestingly, one of the kings of Iraq in the 1920s or 30s said, this is an impossible nation to rule over. It, it's just a, a creation on a, on a map. It doesn't really exist as a coherent nation at all. And with the consequences of that, we are, of course, to this day still living. Of course. Now, you mentioned the 
map that you would have grown up with in schoolrooms as a child with vast parts of the world, some quarter of the world really colored red. This is one of the concrete material culture manifestations of empire in a sense. It's how the British saw the empire on a map. Mm. You also talk quite a bit about some of the other kinds of material visions of empire, the material constructions of empire, the ceremonies of empire, the names, the honors of empire. How did that material cultural world uh, get generated and what was its importance, do you think, to the functioning of the British Empire? One of the other things I wanted to do uh, in this book was to try to get a sense of uh, one of the ways of thinking about the history of empire, that's to say one of the ways in which the empire operated, was the empire as a kind of um, constant ceremonial performance. And I suppose I was much influenced in that. As you can see, there are, I must repeat, there are no original ideas in this book. They're all got from other people and kind of applied uh, to this subject. The person behind that was the American anthropologist Clifford Geertz, who wrote a wonderful book called uh, the Theatre Negara, the Theatre State in 19th Century Bali, where he tried to make the case, not I think wholly convincingly, but it was an in a case that interested me, that as it were, pomp and circumstance and spectacle and ceremonial and dressing up and honorific orders and all of that were not just as it were fripperies and drapery to mask or conceal the naked uh, exercise of power, that they were in fact power itself. Um, that this was what there was, as it were. Um, well, I think he pushed that case further than perhaps it might really go. But that basic point that one of the ways in which one needs to understand power is in its public uh, performative mode, which in the British Empire's case was pageantry, dressing up, knighthoods, coronations, durbars, spectacles seemed to me one well worth pursuing. And so part of ornamentalism uh, is about how the British imagine their empire to be. But then a, a, another part of it, which connects with those imaginings, does relate to the, the spectacle of empire. Um, I don't want to make a kind of Geertzian case that spectacle was all there was to the British empire. That would clearly be ridiculous. But the sense that it was, among other things, a pageant and the pageantry gave it a kind of identity, and perhaps even a coherence, it was of course a royal empire, seemed to me again to be something that hadn't been much discussed by other historians of empire, and to be a topic worth opening up. And so, for example, one can travel around the empire and find towns all named Victoria in any part of the world that was formerly ruled by Britain. There's a kind of coherence on a map and a coherence in architecture, and a coherence in statuary, and so on, that comes from this. And it seems to me, though, that nowhere were these ceremonies and spectacles more vivid than right here in India. Of course, the coronation Durbar, uh, uh, the Durbar of 1877, there are a number of events that brought the British Empire, as it were, to the stage, the public stage of India. There were other kinds of affiliations as well. I wonder whether you think that the connection that the British found in India was, uh, wh why, why was India so sort of vivid and conspicuous in this ornamental order? I think that, um, as I tried to argue in this book, in some senses, <clears throat> the leading sector in the whole drive to an ornamental empire was, in fact, um, South Asia. Um, and of course, that of itself um, is a rather extraordinary phenomenon because during the first half of the 19th century, if one thinks of figures like Macaulay or Dalhousie or Bentinck, uh, administrators, governors, <coughs> their view was um, India is a society mired um, in uh, antiquity. And it's our job as Brits, as the uh, pioneers of progress, we've invented railways as it were, and all this m modern stuff. It's our job to modernize India. And we must get rid of all this uh, antiquity that's here. Um, and so that was essentially the policy which, to a considerable degree during the first half of the 19th century, the British pursued in India, as a result of which they deposed many of the rulers of the princely states, whom they regarded as corrupt, anachronistic, authoritarian, 
um, and set up their own administration instead. Hence, of course, the presidencies of Madras um, and Bombay uh, and Calcutta, as they originally were. After, however, what used to be called the Indian Mutiny, the British on the whole gave that up as a mode of government and as a government policy. They retained it technologically, they liked building railways and dams and all the rest of it, irrigation systems. But they gave up the notion that their mission was to modernize the political structure of India. And they decided instead that their mission was to prop up the traditional structure of India as they understood it. Hence Queen Victoria's proclamation about the kinship between herself as Empress of India and as a monarch and the rulers of the Indian princely states. And that was the beginning of this kind of romantic phase of fascination on the part of the British with the ornamental world of the Indian princely states, uh, the extraordinary palaces, uh, the extraordinary dress and costume, and of course the extraordinary ceremonial associated as the British saw it with Durbar's and with the Mughal emperor to which the British proclaimed Queen Victoria as the direct successor. And the British view was that if you were going to rule India in this way, and if you were going to support the traditional order of the princely states, mm -hmm. then you had to elaborate for the British part of India itself um, a ceremonial style that was no less grand. And so the British became captivated by not only the grandeur of the rulers of the Indian princely states, but captivated by the belief that they must operate on an equivalently <coughs> grand way. The ultimate expression of which, of course, was Lutchins's design for New Delhi. Um, and that whole sense that the British were enthralled by what they saw as the spectacular pageantry of South Asia becomes a major component or not only of the way the British then rule India both directly and indirectly, but more broadly of the empire as a whole. And it's interesting that it's in India uh, in 1877 with the first Durbar that this whole sense of elaborate pageantry, initially here but subsequently spread throughout the British Empire, gets going. And again, one can see material uh, manifestations of this, for example, the Indo Saracenic architecture that then goes on to be built in Kuala Lumpur, Indeed. where it has no uh, indigenous connection, so to speak, but is transplanted. You mentioned Latienza's Delhi. It reminds me of a film that you can watch on uh, YouTube. I think it's put up there by the British Film Institute. It's a historical film uh, that was made uh, uh, about the city of Delhi, I think part of a series of, of British films about the empire, and it describes the history of Delhi and the successive empires and uh, regimes that uh, uh, ruled from Delhi with the repeated line in the film that the ninth emperor would come and rule forever. And it runs through the different empires. It ends with a panorama of the relatively newly built Lechins Delhi with this proclamation, the ninth empire will rule forever. The film was made in 1938. Well, they, they got the prediction wrong, it's fair to say. Yes. Very spectacularly. Yes. I mean, it is, uh, I mean, as a piece of architecture and town planning, New Delhi seems to me to be utterly extraordinary. What is even more extraordinary is that the British were building that in the 1920s and early 1930s. And they thought this really would be the permanent base of their power in South Asia. And within not much more than a decade, that, of course, was all over. Absolutely. Well, now, one of the wonderful things in David's book, Ornamentalism, are, of course, the illustrations. And there are magnificent illustrations of some of the, the costumes of empire. Uh, but there's also an arresting image uh, toward the end of one of the, Nure of the Nuremberg rallies. And I was reminded of that, again, in connection, of course, with Lechins as Delhi, a rough contemporary. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, first of all, why that image is there, and what you see as distinctive about the British ceremonial culture in contrast to some of the other kinds of imperial ceremonial cultures so uh, widespread and influential, it must be said, in the world of the 1930s. One of the things that the British loved doing was dressing up for these extravagant imperial ceremonials, Durbar's, Jubilees, coronations, uh, royal funerals, and so on. And the 
way in which those ceremonials worked was that they were in many ways essentially anachronistic. Um, you know, why does Queen Elizabeth II need horses to pull her from Buckingham Palace to St. Paul's Cathedral when she could actually go in a car, as it were? Why do they do that? It is all very odd. But the ceremonial style that the British developed um, off the back of their encounters in India uh, and therefore around the empire was one that was in many ways very anachronistic. Um, it was built around um, horses and around elephants, of course, in this country. Um, and it was very restrained and understated. Um, and the costumes were all rather old-fashioned, plume hats and all the rest of it. And so it gave an impression of continuity and an impression, which to this day it still does, I think, as I've said, of anachronism. That this wasn't the way most people actually lived their lives. Whereas, of course, the ceremonial associated, say, with Stalin's Russia, um, the parades in Red Square, uh, or Mussolini's Italy, um, or above all, I suppose, Hitler's Germany, the Nuremberg rallies, back to your question, was essentially that it was high-tech, it was modern, um, it was pioneering the future. And I think that by the 1920s and 30s, by contrast, uh, the British ceremonial had become settled both domestically and imperially, in this essentially anachronistic and allegedly traditional form, thereby conveying, or at least people thought it conveyed, a wholly different notion of what the British Empire or Britain were about uh, than these rather dangerous, uh, upstart, fascist and communist regimes. And so, in a sense, we can see in the ornamental culture that knitted together Britain and the Empire an explanation of sorts for why Britain's political trajectory in the first half of the 20th century diverged in some key respects from those of some continental powers. It's yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and I think it is interesting to ponder um, what an astonishing enterprise by the 1920s and 30s the British Empire had become. Because another of the ways of thinking about it, which I didn't talk about in this book, but have become interested in later, is that quite a lot of what I described here, certainly for the period before 1914, was also going on uh, in the Russian Empire and in the German Empire and in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Huge elaboration of coronations, funerals, dressing up. Um, and they were, in a sense, the obvious connections and comparators to the British monarchy and the British Empire. And of course, after 1918, those three great European Asiatic empires disappeared. Uh, the Romanovs went in Russia, the Hohenzollerns went in Germany, and the Habsburgs went in Austria-Hungary. Uh, to be replaced by these high-tech authoritarian regimes, either communist or fascist, whereas Britain and its empire carries on for at least one more generation, uh, still as it were, uh, in the same mode that had been elaborated in the period before 1914. And in fact, an, a, a nice example of how Britain, in turn, dedicates itself more to the empire than to, say, continental Europe, can be seen in the contrast between the jubilees of Queen Victoria in 1887, the 50th, and 1897, the 60th, the golden and the diamond. The golden jubilee is a ceremony that welcomes all of the little princelings of Europe into the <coughs> central, uh, onto center stage, whereas the uh, Jubilee of 1897 welcomes all of the princes from around the empire to process through London. Yes, so that, that contrast is very well pointed up. The British monarchy had a variety of different saliences, as it were. It was the, the thing that held the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland together. It was part of this European trade union of royalty. Queen Victoria married off all her children into the different ruling royal houses. Um, and it was that notion of monarchy that was celebrated, as you say, in 1887. All her royal relatives come from Europe for the Golden Jubilee. But for 1897, it's the imperial monarchy, the monarchy which ties together this extraordinary royal empire with these close connections between the British monarchy and other monarchies elsewhere uh, in the empire. And it's those people who come to pay homage to the Queen in 1897, not her relatives. And so what we see then going into the 20th century is a British empire that is confident in its spectacle, that is dedicated to the perpetuation of certain forms of rule, 
that is in turn ruled by certain constituencies that are by now well established, often hereditary, both in Britain and abroad, and an imperial order that appears to be quite distinctive in contrast to that of some rival emerging states. And yet, with all of this confidence, with all of this spectacle, with all of these ties and, and elaborate schemes to preserve and indeed extend the loyalty of subjects to the imperial crown, within a matter of essentially moments of the grand scheme of history, this system falls apart. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about how this came apart, not the empire as a whole, of course, but the ornamental structures of empire that you talk about? It is very astonishing to think that between 1947, uh, when uh, India becomes independent, and 1997, uh, when Hong Kong was returned to the Chinese, on the 100th anniversary of the Diamond Jubilee, which was the apogee of empire, the whole show disappears. Um, it will be uh, one of the lines in the obituaries of Queen Elizabeth II, that under her, while she was monarch, Britain lost more territory than under any other monarch in human history. Not, I think, an epitaph she will like, but it's nevertheless true. Um, and one of the aspects of the disintegration of the British Empire uh, was, as you've rightly suggested, Maya, the disappearance of this whole ornamental, uh, elaborate performance, which was, in a sense, part of what the empire was. Um, and it's very interesting to ponder the way, what happens when uh, parts of the empire become independent to this whole interlocking ornamental world. And of course, the classic instance of that is what happens here in India. Uh, what happens here is that the British simply abandon, um, because they feel it's no longer sustainable, the whole way in which the regime here had worked. Uh, a pivotal part of that had been, from 1857 8 onwards, the close alliance between the British and the rulers of the Indian princely states. They'd invented all these durbars at which the princes performed and paraded. They'd invented orders of chivalry uh, to incorporate uh, the, ruling, the rulers of the princely states into the imperial elite. They had built New Delhi, uh, which was going to be this thousand-year monument, as it were, to that world. And what then happens, of course, is that the British are utterly ruthless uh, in changing the notion of who they'll do business with. They sell the rulers of the Indian princely states down the river, uh, and they decide to do business instead uh, with Gandhi and with Nehru and, of course, with Jinnah. Uh, they give up on the old agrarian hierarchical supporters of the empire because they realize there's no future in that, and they shift their negotiating um, initiatives uh, to the urban, middle-class, well-educated uh, elite. And they're wholly ruthless in abandoning the princes to their fate, um, and they have the perfect front man to do that. That's to say the last viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, cousin of the king, and it's Mountbatten essentially who repudiates all the treaties that had previously existed between the British and the rulers of the Indian principal states. So what then happens in the case of India, as in the case of most other uh, colonies which become nations, is exactly what you described in your talk on Liberty's Exiles two days ago, there's a struggle to throw out the colonial power, but there's also the struggle to decide who of the people left in the colony in our nation will control the post-colonial state. Um, and in most cases, uh, with regard to the dissolution of the British Empire, the British, as it were, are thrown out and all the hierarchical imperial honours go. And on the whole, the indigenous traditional rulers on whom the British had relied were repudiated, and the colony which becomes a nation is run instead by the well-educated, literate middle class. And that begins in India, and that's the general pattern that became the general pattern for most uh, colonies as they become uh, nations. And so they repudiate both the coherent imperial ornamental world of the empire as a whole by becoming independent, and they repudiate the people in their own country who had bought into that and whom the British had divided. And we see in some other post-colonial states a reliance on the military, which would also perhaps fit into the, into that model. Into the model. It's, a, it's an interesting um, 
point that I think is too rarely made, that in the dissolution of the British Empire and indeed all of the, uh, uh, well, the French Empire, so many other European empires in the period after World War II, we see not only the emergence of 50 or more independent nation states, the world goes from having about 50 nation states in about 1900 to having about 200 nation states in 2000. Not only do we see the incredible multiplication of nation states, but we also see the incredible multiplication of specific forms of rule and governance in those nation states, specifically models on a loosely democratic republican form. Do you think that that can be explained in part by the way in which the British ruled their empire? I think it certainly can in part. I mean, it, it is a point often overlooked that in 1910, um, the majority of the world was ruled in the form of empires, and the majority of empires were royal empires. Um, and if John Darwin is to be believed, that's in fact the default mode of human organization. Um, and the world that we live in, which is a creation of the period since 1945, with, as you say, 200 nation states, most of them republicans, republics, many of them democracies, most of them perhaps claiming or wanting to be democracies, is an astonishingly recent development for which there is no precedent in the whole of human history. Um, and therefore, I suppose there is no guarantee this is how things will continue to be any more than the British were able to keep their empire going for a thousand years. So the world that we live in now of democratic republican nation states as the prevailing mode in which societies organize themselves is of relatively recent origin. And of course, Myra, as you rightly say, one of the explanations for that is that that's what happens as the great European empires and indeed the Soviet empire collapse. Uh, most of them, not all of them, royal empires replaced by these democratic republican regimes. But with the exception of the United States of America, and I suppose France, they are, and some of the Latin American republics, republican regimes, or regimes as democratic republics, are a relatively recent creation. And most of them have been being created off the wreckage uh, and the eclipse of the earlier European empires, in particular the British. Now, and of course, Britain itself is something of an exception to the norm of the present day international order of democratic republics, in as much as it is not a republic. Uh, and indeed, one could perhaps argue, I wonder if you would, that the legacy of this ornamental order in Britain itself has been, if anything, to prolong the endurance of a monarchy or aristocracy in Britain. Yes, I think that's right. I think that um, one of the things which empire, uh, the British Empire, from, as it were, the 1850s through to the 1950s, certainly did, was to provide a whole new global justification for the British monarchy and provide a whole new set of global jobs for the British aristocracy. John, uh, as proconsuls, as viceroys of India, par excellence, John Bright, radical British politician, famously said, that the British Empire was nothing other than a vast system of poor relief for the aristocracy. That there were other ways to describe it, but that that was really what it was all about. Well, I don't think that's the whole of the story, but it certainly is true that empire gave jobs to the aristocracy and justification to the British monarchy of a wholly new form. Um, and it made the British monarchy a global monarchy, and I think one of the reasons why the Queen still clings to the concept of the Commonwealth so tenaciously um, is that that still gives her a kind of starring global role, which if she was just king of the United Kingdom, um, or even the United Kingdom without Scotland, as it may be later this year, certainly wouldn't have done. Now, I'm sure the audience is full of questions for David, but I'm going to just usurp my position uh, with one last question, and this is uh, inspired by David's extensive work on uh, studying the history of teaching uh, the history of Britain, in Britain. And I wanted to ask, you know, this book was written in, in 2000, published in 2001, and it opens with the idea that we live in uh, post-millennial Britain, we live in post-imperial times. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on uh, both perhaps how this book, how you might write this book differently now, post 
and on how you see the legacy of empire working itself out in uh, British education today. Well, it's certainly true that this book, like any book that anybody writes, is a very time-bound production, um, and it's sufficiently far back now for it to be possible to see that. Um, and one of the things which did encourage me to, uh, as it were, put together all these ideas by other people and try to claim I'd come up with an idea of my own was 1997, which was the 100th anniversary of the Diamond Jubilee, the greatest imperial extravaganza ever uh, in Britain. Um, and of course, uh, also the year of the Hong Kong handover, which meant the British Empire really was finally over. And so it was written, I suppose, partly on the basis that the British Empire now really was a historical subject because it kind of was over. Um, and so it was, though that was the specific a circumstance under which um, I wrote it. Um, had I written it, written the book as it were post 9-11, I think it would have had a very different uh, mode of organization, partly because perhaps some of these things that I was interested in uh, would have got less prominence. And partly I think because 9-11 I think did produce a wholly new way of thinking about relations between what is called the West and other parts of the world. Um, and I suppose in the light of that I might have structured the book somewhat differently and I might also have tried to put into it a more comparative element there's really very little in here on other empires um, it is a strange paradox and I certainly am guilty of this criticism that imperial history covers very large areas of the globe by definition but in some ways it can also be very parochial um, because one feels well one empire is more than enough to be going on with so why do I need to know about any others and I think if I were writing this book now, I would want to talk much more about uh, comparing, uh, as it were, the ornamentalism of the British Empire with that of other empires, and that would be a different way of doing it. There's also two chapters that really aren't in this book that ought to be in. One was a chapter about the ritual and ceremonial of the established church, but I just couldn't, nobody had actually had any ideas on that that I could pull in, so I couldn't write about that. And also military ceremonial, especially built around the navy and the army. Um, and there really ought to be chapters about that, but uh, there aren't, or at least not yet, maybe I'll have another go. Um, your other point about how the British Empire is taught in Britain now, it's a hugely contentious subject in that there are those who argue that it should be taught as an example of all the terrible things that Britain did to the world, uh, and others who argue that it should be taught as an example of all the good things that Britain did to the world, and there's a very polarised debate about that. I don't think it actually gets very far because the positions are so entrenched and the conversations kind of don't happen. Um, but it's a very contentious subject in that way. Um, there is a certain degree of teaching of the British Empire in British schools um, as part of the national curriculum. Um, and it can be taught as a heroic story, it can be taught as a terrible story. But on the whole, I have to say, it isn't much taught. Um, one of the odder aspects of the British Empire is that apart from the people at the top who I wrote about here, I think many people in Britain were when the empire existed rather indifferent to it, um, and now it's gone rather indifferent to it as well. Um, I mean, let me give one example, and it's a very pertinent example given the country I'm lucky enough to be visiting at the moment. If you said to most people in Britain today, why is it that there are so many Indian restaurants in Britain? Why are there so many? I think most people wouldn't have an answer to that. That's to say they wouldn't know that part of the explanation is that for 200 years and more, the British had this very close and complicated connection with India, and Indian restaurants are one of the latest manifestations of that connection. But I suspect that most people in Britain today, if you ask them why there are so many Indian restaurants in Britain, actually wouldn't know. Whereas I think if you asked most Indians today why cricket is so widespread in India, they would know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a very suggestive and revealing contrast. So with this, uh, let's, uh, let's hear from you, because I'm sure there are many, many questions. I saw the gentleman in the brown sweater with his hand up first. A microphone will be coming around, so please wait for the microphone. 
Uh, I just like to know whether you talk about certain British traditions which still carry on and the resistance to them or the lack of it in countries. For example, like in India, the in the judiciary, uh, still there is a uh, practice of referring to the judge as my lord. And recently, somebody in Delhi, I guess, challenged that thing in the court itself. So, have you talked about this kind of traditions of uh, resistance which are still going, uh, continuing, and the lack of it? Uh, in your book or something? Well, um, I haven't talked about it enough. I mean, there isn't any subject in this book that I've talked about enough, in the book, as it were, um, and where there's lots more work to be done. But certainly one of the areas where I think there is a lot of work still to do is what I might want to call the export of British traditions and organizations. Um, and some of those, I think, have survived the dismantling of the global ornamental empire. Um, it's certainly true, for example, that clubs, um, gentlemen's clubs as they used to be, um, military ceremonial, fox hunting, uh, Gothic cathedrals, um, in all those sorts of ways, there are residues in this country and in other parts of what was once the empire, which still exist to this day. And it's certainly interesting that although the system of imperial honors, which the British created, to tie together uh, this multinational empire. Although those have disappeared, the Indian orders of chivalry that the British invented, the order of the Star of India, and the order of the Indian Empire, for example, gone. Um, and most former parts of the British Empire no longer award imperial honors. But what instead they've done is invent their own honors systems, which are often actually modeled on the British system that they've just repudiated. And that certainly would be true in Canada, uh, and in New Zealand, and in Australia. Um, and also in other parts of the world as well. Um, so that I don't think that ornamentalism and dressing up um, and honorific systems uh, of uh, recognition were unique to the British Empire. Um, I do think that the British perfected a particularly global and complicated form uh, of these imperial modes. But I think it's also true that in many other empires similar modes were developed, perhaps not so elaborately. And I think it's true that in most of the successor states to the British Empire, residues or adaptations of the imperial ornamentalist modes are still to be found. In the uh, orange or grey jacket. Speaking of one of the things that has been exported from Britain to uh, India has been the education system, and you spoke of Macaulay a little bit in the beginning. So I was wondering how much do you see that ornamentalism playing into the early education systems that Britain tried to kind of place in the country itself, and also how that has um, changed over the years or hasn't. You still see a lot of these schools um, still do the march passes. They still have their uniforms. They still have, obviously, the English languages primary in these schools. And also, in what ways do we see also the shift of uh, how education became responsible for creating this elite, where it went from being um, built for the princely states and those princes and such, and nowadays, a lot of times, you see the elite business class going to these schools as well. Well, I think it's certainly clear that what Macaulay hoped for was, of course, to create um, residents of South Asia on a British educated model. Um, and of course what then developed, perhaps not entirely as Macaulay would have wanted, since Macaulay on the whole was in favour of modernising South Asia, was of course the development in the second half of the 19th century of a variety of colleges uh, and universities to some degree, but especially colleges modelled on British public schools which were intended to educate uh, the rulers of the Indian princely states, and of course did just that, and perhaps still to this day do with their successors, though they're no longer rulers of the Indian princely states. The problem then the British found themselves caught with was that a lot of other South Asians were getting themselves educated, um, and as it were, didn't buy into this whole British ornamentalist regime in the way that the rulers of the Indian princely states did. And that then gave rise to this British view that they were much happier dealing with the rulers of the Indian princely states, who they thought were aristocratic, royal, princely, lived in grand houses, owned great estates, were the analogues, as it were, of the Duke of Westminster or the Duke of Devonshire, and they could kind of understand those people. 
what they didn't like were the city dwelling, city educated, uh, very bright middle class lawyers. Which comes back to my point that in the end they're forced nevertheless to do business with those people. And so the British model of empire, spectacularly so in India, but also true elsewhere, was essentially agrarian, <laughs> rural, hierarchical. Um, and of course, most public schools in Britain, and I suspect the colleges here, were situated in the countryside, and this was thought to be the way to do things. And this notion of large cities full of well-educated middle-class people, often of radical political persuasion, wasn't the way the British wanted their empire to work. And that, of course, is why they moved the capital from Calcutta to Delhi. They took it away from the city, which was full of clever, slick, well-educated middle-class lawyers whom the British didn't like, and they moved it to this kind of ruling princely heartland at the center of India, where there weren't any of those people. Um, so that you know, education had lots of unforeseen and for the British unwanted consequences, because although it helped assimilate the rulers of the princely states to the ornamentalist order of empire, it also made possible the rise of a well-educated nationalist class who repudiated the whole thing. I see the lady by the camera back there. Macaulay, in his notes, he says that the British should create a class that will work as babus for them. It's a working class that he created. And uh, we are all victims of it. And I'm talking to you in English today. And maybe I haven't read literature in any of my own languages. Uh, he killed 17 languages that were well established with 2,000 years old literature of their own. They are dead languages today. I mean, um, so that's what happened to our education system. It's not that we never had an education system or we were not educated, but when you read Macaulay's treaties, I think they are discussed. I still have a lot of respect for him, but those notes that he wrote, why English language should be the language medium of instruction in India, I think it was really in bad days. And we have lost 17 languages that were rich in their literature and culture. Well, I entirely agree in, in, in this regard that that was indeed Macaulay's view, that Britain was uh, a modernizing world and the way of the future, and that India was an old world and the way of the past, and that what you needed to do was to move India uh, from where it was to where the British thought they knew how to take it. Uh, I hold no brief for that view, but I certainly don't deny for one moment that that was what Macaulay thought he ought to do. Uh, at the, uh, in the glasses of the scarf. Hello, thanks. Uh, I, have, I have two questions which I hope are related. Uh, so you, you mentioned in, in terms of the mission the British Empire saw, uh, it comes to me both missions, like the, the, the first one which, with which they came to India was to modernize India because they saw it as a country uh, in great in antiquity. <coughs> and the second one which, they, which eventually bowled uh, was to uh, leverage the strengths of India and strengthen what India was at that point in time. But but growing up growing up in the country, whatever we have heard about the British Empire uh, is that you know uh, it plundered it plundered India as a nation. So how do you see the difference between the intentions in case they were virtuous uh, when when British Empire came to India and what it actually did to the country by the time they left India and. Uh, and you mentioned that, that eventually it ended because it, they, they saw colonialism as not sustainable. Was it, uh, was it a consequence of the Indian freedom movement reaching a crescendo or, or, or something else? Which is eventually, or, or, or was the tipping point something else because of which uh, the British Empire ended? Thanks. Well, um, I couldn't possibly answer those questions in the length that they certainly merit um, in the time that's available. Um, I certainly think it is true as far as the British governing classes were concerned that there were these two different models uh, of uh, how they thought the British should govern India. The one being to overturn everything, as was mentioned so eloquently in the previous question, which was, as it were, Macaulay's view, 
the other was to preserve everything, which is what they decided to do after 1857 to 8. Um, how those very different policies play out, whether in fact, albeit as different policies, in fact they play out differently, there's a very extended and very properly not yet concluded debate on. As for the issue of how and why in the end uh, the British quit India and India becomes independent and partitioned, uh, well again, uh, there is a whole historical industry, indeed there are many historical industries devoted um, to that. I don't think there's any doubt that a very substantial explanation must reside in the growth of an educated class who could mobilize and who wanted to get the British out. There isn't any doubt of that in any explanation as to why the British leave India. That must be hugely important. Uh, I think that the Second World War must be hugely important because that destabilizes, uh, consequent upon the rise and military success of Japan, the whole British presence in uh, India and in the Far East. Uh, and that must clearly be an important part of any explanation. And I think the fact that Britain arrives in 1945 practically bankrupt, and therefore the, the material resources to govern, and in a sense the will to govern, also disappear, um, or at least become unsustainable. Uh, now, there are many more explanations beyond that that would have to be uh, brought in, since I think uh, both the existence of empire and the end of empire are very, very complicated historical phenomena. Uh, but certainly those three, the rise of an educated middle class uh, agitating for uh, independence, uh, the impact of Japan's extraordinary military successes, um, and, which as it were caused the bluff of European dominance, um, and I think the unsustainability from a British perspective after 1945 of the whole imperial enterprise would rank as very important uh, explanations in that. We have time for one last question, and the lady who has patiently had her hand up uh, just here in the uh, blonde hair. Yes. Brief question, brief answer. Right. Did it cost the British more to run the Indian colony than the economic benefit that they gained from it? Uh, the British gained an enormous amount of benefit from India. Uh, the economic case is extraordinarily complicated. The greatest benefit that the British got from India was the Indian Army. Uh, it was that which made Britain a world power. And the case or the argument that the diehard uh, opponents of Indian independence, including, of course, Winston Churchill, always made was if we lose India, we lose the Indian Army, and we cease to be a great power. And such, indeed, it turned out to be. A very big question and a very uh, a succinct uh, and meaningful answer. And I would, could extend that comment to apply to the last hour, which we've heard. It's a, a wonderful performance of erudition, learning, insight, even if cribbed, uh, and ornamented by extraordinary wit. So with this, let us thank Professor Canada for his discussion today. Thank you, David.